guess first off, let me say, and, and this has always uh, amazed me, and that is that any situation, and especially um, what, what may be more uh, focused on a family um, or, or a smaller group of people than what we're dealing with right now, but in, in any one situation, God has the ability to be doing multiple things in that situation. I, I think just by way of example, when a family goes through uh, some kind of crisis or, or turmoil, um, each individual out of it, it may be sort of one circumstance. Maybe it's a sickness. Somebody's diagnosed with a sickness. Um, and, and each person is sort of affected differently um, by that. And yet God uses one situation to do different things in each life if we will allow him. And, and I guess I kind of feel like that um, under this current situation. And uh, I, I guess as a, as a pastor, um, so far, my focus is more so on those that I'm responsible for leading and, and being a shepherd to. And, uh, I, and so again here this evening, what I want to share is, is uh, really about sort of us on an individual basis. Uh, I am certain that God is using what we're going through to, uh, to impact the church, to impact the world, and there's a variety of things that he's doing through that. But, but I want to focus, uh, and I think in a lot of ways that's been the focus of the things I've shared the last week or so, whether, whether on Sunday mornings in a church service or the other broadcasts that we've had, is, is really been more... Uh, applicable to, to us as individuals. And so tonight is, is going to kind of be uh, the same thing. Um, I guess two Sunday nights ago, um, it's hard to believe this has all kind of only been a week that we're dealing with everything being kind of amped up. And so two Sunday nights ago, uh, Jalen had mentioned in, in leading worship um, and then I, I referenced it again later, and I've now mentioned it a couple of times in different settings. But in the Conquer series, in the Life Course, um, part two of the Conquer series that we started a couple of weeks ago, uh, they, they made a point in there about the difference between knowing and believing. And, and there, is a, there is a difference between what we know, but also what we believe. And, and I guess um, uh, that... that That'll kind of be the broad uh, theme here, if you will, uh, with, with what I want to share with you here this evening. And uh, I, I want to use I want to use Job as kind of an example of this idea of of the difference of knowing and believing. Um, and so uh, Job one and verse number one says there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. The Amplified Bible says it this way, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and, no, and, and one who reverently feared God, and abstained from and shunned evil because... It was wrong. And then lastly, that verse in the Living Bible says, There lived in the land of Uz a man named Job, a good man who feared God and stayed away from evil. So, so here is a man that had knowledge of God. And based on his knowledge of God, the scripture says he, he feared God and he eschewed evil, or the Amplified, he shunned evil. Uh, the Living Bible, he stayed away from evil. And, and this was based simply on his knowledge of God, if you will. And, and then if you go to chapter, uh, go a little bit further down in chapter 1, and, and uh, this is sort of the dialogue between the Lord and Satan. In verse 7, it says, The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, 
a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job, God, doth Job fear God for naught? So verse number one says simply says that he was a perfect and an upright man, but verse number eight says that there was there was not another one like Job in all of the earth. And so um, I, I, I guess the DSW translation of verse eight is that Job was the most upright man in the earth. He was a perfect and an upright man. But again, at this point, this is based on Job's knowledge of who God is. The, the Bible tells us, Paul tells us, that faith comes by hearing. And so all faith starts with hearing. That, that's the starting point of faith. But but there is a much stronger level of faith that comes from once we have seen and experienced. And so again, in, in this particular time of Job's life, I, I, I would, I would uh, propose to you that he was simply operating on his knowledge. He was operating on what he knew about God. And, and let me give you a few things that I think demonstrate why Job was operating at this point on a knowledge of God and, and that his belief, uh, his, his faith in God was not fully developed. Uh, but before I get into some of those examples, go on to chapter 2 and verse 3. Uh, Satan has now taken everything Job has. Job's lost everything but his wife. And uh, Satan is, is still upset, and God says again to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So, so Job, uh, Satan said, Job is only serving you for what you do for him. And, and so God said, fine, you can, you can touch his stuff, you can take his possessions, but you can't touch his body and you can't take his life. And so Satan does that. And, and the end of chapter 1 tells us that Job, um, Job got down and worshipped. And his response to all of that was, the Lord gives and the Lord takes, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Satan is kind of riled up again, and, and, and God says um, to him, again, have you considered Job? And again he says, he is, he, there's, there's none like him in all the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God. And then he says, he's still, in spite of what you've done to him, he is still holding on to his faith and his trust in who I am. Well, let's look at a few things uh, that, that I think throughout Job's story kind of demonstrate that he was in this progression of going from what he knew to what he really believed. So Job 29, verse number 1 says this, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. When his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, as I was, notice, notice the past tense here that Job is using, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me. So to me, Job is doing something here that is, is a... I think sort of a common pitfall that we as believers have, and that is we measure, as I said this morning, we measure God's presence. We also measure God's approval or disapproval by our external circumstances. Job, the perfect and upright man that the Lord, and notice this wasn't just people's opinion. This wasn't human's opinion, human opinions of Job. This is what God was saying about Job. He is perfect and he's upright. If you've got God saying that about you, it must be true. Uh, we, we may see each other and be impressed with each other uh, because of our, our conduct, our character, but the bottom line is we don't see everything about each other. I, 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 I 
even my wife doesn't see and know everything about me. She doesn't know all of my thoughts. And so God knows everything about Job, and he says he's perfect and he's upright. And, and, and that was all of that behavior was based on Job's knowledge of God. But even with Job uh, shunning evil, running from evil, staying away from evil, now that he's in the middle of this adversity, he, he says, I, I, I want to go back. I want to go back to where God was with me. I, I want to go back to the days when God preserved me. I, I want to go back to when his candle shined upon my head. The days when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. Now, had God abandoned Job? Was, was God now not with Job? We, we know from the verse, some of the verses we've already read that in fact, God had confidence in Job, and God trusted Job, and so what, what Job is going through is because of the fact that, that really God is with him. And yet Job says, if I could go back, if I could, if I could we, we say it like this, I guess, if I could go back to the good old days, <laughs> if I could go back to the good old times, because when, when, if, if we could rewind the clock to two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we weren't quarantined, when we weren't having to worry about 250 people gathering and then 10 people gathering, and who knows what this week will hold, if we could go back to those days. And, and, and I know I keep repeating some things uh, sort of in each, each, each video, each message. Um, it, it is not a senior moment at this point. It may be one day, but right now it's not. I just feel so strongly that it is so critical that we come through this with the lessons that God wants us to learn, right. not about the coronavirus, right. but beyond that, beyond this circumstance and situation, because again, individually, we've got stuff that we have gone through, are going through, and will go through. And, and I believe one of the things God wants to do for us individually is bring us through all of this with our trust and confidence in Him solidified more than ever before. I, I have been amazed in, in the different ways now in which I have been involved, and I realize some of you, your, your whole context is simply being on the other end of the streaming, but whether it's uh, what we've done the two Sunday mornings now or... Uh, what we did last Sunday night, and then particularly what we did here this evening. The, the reality of the presence of God in all of those circumstances. Yeah. Stephen has now told me twice about their experience with gathering together with a few people and, and, and watching the live stream and how real the presence of God is and how, how, how it's, it's not any less uh, because we are not all together or we're not in a certain location. And, and I, I really am not sure we've ever e experienced that in the way in which we are experiencing. I, I know that we have, uh, we've all had our own times of prayer and devotion and fellowship with God, but, I, but I, I think there's something unique about the fact that we are sort of doing the same thing at the same time but in different places and yet, person after person testifies how powerful the presence of God is, no matter where they are. And, and so, uh, I, think, I think God is wanting us individually as we come through this. And again, whatever He's, whatever he's wanting to, to, to do to the church as a whole, to the church worldwide, I know He's got things He's doing. I know He's got things He's saying. But... Again, I guess call it my pastor's heart. My, my primary focus is, is on the, the saints uh, that I am responsible for leading. And, and I just I believe that God is, is wanting all of us. And, and I'm, I'm sure those that are gathered here with me this evening and those of you that are watching, that you, you, we all have a degree of faith. But the Bible talks about going from faith to faith. And, and I believe as much as we, many of us, have gone from knowing sort of about God to faith in God, there, there's a deeper level that's available to us all. And, and so again, here's Job, who, who, who has this faith in God or, or this knowledge of God 
that is that is strong enough. I mean, let's be honest for a moment. <laughs> let's be honest more than a moment, but we'll be honest especially for a moment. How many of us that are full of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and 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 we are we are uh, pursuing being disciples of Jesus Christ? How many of us could honestly it be said, or could the same thing be said of us that we are we we are running from evil? I, I know some Holy Ghost filled people that are trying to figure out how close can I get. And so here's a man that did not have the Spirit of God. And simply on his knowledge of God, his knowledge about God, he avoided evil. He feared God and avoided evil. But again, there, there is, if I could say it this way, and I'm not being critical of Job because I'm, I'm, I think there's a great help to us that can come from Job. There, there is still an incompleteness to Job's knowledge and relationship with God. When when he's saying, I, I want to go back to when God was with me. I, I want to go back to when the presence of God surrounded me. That that's that's demonstrating his knowledge has not yet passed to the belief that it needs to be. Job 23, I think, is a another one of the examples that we can find throughout the book of Job that demonstrate this. Verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I, I said it this morning, and I was reminded afterwards that we're not supposed to be touching our faces as I've been doing because my nose is itching and there's no poinsettias around, so it's not a reaction. Uh, but I, as I said this morning, where, where can God go? God can't go anywhere. And, and yet Job is saying, I wish I could find God. The bottom line is most of us, maybe not in the exact words that Job says this, but most of us have thought something along these lines. And some of us have actually asked, God, where are you? Where are you, God? My world seems to be falling apart. I, I, I'm dealing with adversity. I'm going through trials. I'm going through tribulations. Where are you? And Job says, if I could just find him, I could come to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I, I, I don't think this is misinterpreting this verse. I think uh, kind of what Job is saying here is if I could find God, I'd give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> Um, and again, I think most of us have been there. God, you, you need to listen to me because I, I can straighten you out. I would order my cause before him, fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. I can't find him. I don't know where he is, and I know the sequence of these uh, two, two places we've read. I'm, I'm reading them uh, sort of backwards here, but but I think it, this next verse is is giving a bit of an inclination that Job is going from just knowledge to belief, because while he says I can't find him, I have looked everywhere and I can't find him. In verse ten, he says he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I cannot find him, but he knows where I am. And, and, and to me, that's a part of his transition. Because part of what I think Job is starting to say is it's really not about me knowing where God is and, and believing that God is with me. If I can have the confidence that God knows where I am. I know, I think the uh, Cape St. Clair Fire Department is the one that's closest to our house, 
And uh, so I, I know exactly where that fire department is. I, I know there are paramedics there. But if I, was, if I was here in my home all by myself and my phone was not in reach and I fell and, and I could not get to my phone and I had some kind of uh, injury or heart attack or something, how much good would it do me in that moment that I know where the fire department is? No good at all. I, I, I know exactly where. In fact, I passed by it on, on a fairly regular basis uh, throughout a given week because there's a, there's a couple of places I go, grocery store, barber shop, that I pass right by that fire department. I know where it is. But the biggest, the biggest or the most important thing is not me knowing where the fire department is. The biggest thing is me is the fire department knowing where I am. And, and you and I, if we could just settle that, and if we could just get the confidence, there may be some times I go forward and I go backward and I go left and I go right, and it doesn't seem like I can find God. But... He knows. He knows where I am. And then he says this, My foot has held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. I, I, have, I have kept to the path that God has. When, when it's been sort of tempting to take a diversion, when, it's, when, when there seems to be some alternatives that I could... Uh, alternative ways that I could go. God's leading this way, and, and, and I'd rather go that way because this way seems better. It's a very, very dangerous thing, as most of us probably have experienced at some point, to choose the way that seems to be the best way. Oftentimes, what seems to be the best way is not the best way. And a lot of times, God's way appears to be the most challenging, difficult way. And yet, God's way is the best way. And so Job says, I, my feet have held his steps. It, it's as if he was saying that his feet had a, had a holding, grasping power like our hands do. And then verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So there, there's this progression to me that's taking place in Job's life. We, we start off chapter 1. Here is a perfect, upright man. Knows God or, or fears God and 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 eschews evil, runs from evil, uh, uh, stays away from evil. But but when adversity comes, when the challenges to his life come, suddenly he's the God who he has feared and the God who has uh, essentially motivated him to abstain or to run from evil. He's now wanting to know where has that God gone. And, and if I could go back, if I could, if I could rewind the clock to the days where I knew he was with me. But again, from our perspective, we know, we believe God never left him. God never abandoned him. God was always with him. And so here is, to me, what, what summarizes this process in Job's life of starting off of knowing but then moving into believing. And many of you will recognize this because I've said so many times now, this is my favorite verse in all of Scripture. And that's chapter 42 and verse number 5. Job says here, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now, but now, my eye sees you. Now, really, it's pretty amazing. And, and, and again, I'm not here to critique Job, to criticize Job. In fact, quite the opposite. Because all he at first, all he had done was hear about God. He had knowledge of God. And Job's knowledge of God was enough to cause him to live a lifestyle that causes God to say, 
This is the most upright man in all of the earth. And, and yet now Job, at the end of it, says, if I could put it this way, at the beginning of the book of Job, what he's saying is, all I had done at that point was hear about God. But now I have seen him with my own eye. I, I, I think that's the culmination of what we know versus what we believe. Because what, what we know simply by what we've been told, we, that, that's not always the most stable faith. Again, I know Scripture says faith comes by hearing, and it's got to start there. Faith has to start by hearing. But I believe the will of God is that we all make this transition where my faith is not based on hearing, my faith is based on seeing based on what I have seen, because uh, a faith that is just based on hearing, it, it, it has some weaknesses to it. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's possible to cause somebody to question their faith when all that is is what they've heard. But when you've moved into what you have seen, I, 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 my parents... Uh, we're already in Annapolis, starting Antioch when, when I was born, and so this is all I've known. But I, I, I'm not here today. I'm not here this evening uh, uh, sharing with you because what I know in my head. The reason I'm still here at 48 years old is because I've seen things with my own eyes. I have experienced things for myself. To, to the person, let me just use this example, to the person that has never spoken in tongues, uh, they've just been told what the Bible says, there, there's some room for doubt. There's some room to, to, to try to cause them to question. But to the person that has had the experience of speaking in other tongues, as the Spirit has given the utterance, as I've said many times, as much as I've been around this all my life, and I got the Holy Ghost when I was seven years old, there's times even now that I speak in tongues and my natural mind is saying, what are you doing? This is, this is crazy. This is, this is... But yet, I've experienced it. Right. And it's not just knowledge. It's now my belief. Mm -hmm. And my belief is based on my experience. And so Job says, I, I've heard of him. I've heard of him, but now I have seen him. And, and, and again, I know that, that all of you have things that you could already testify to that, that you have seen God do, that you have seen God come through. But I, I just feel like one of the very basic, and, and this may be kind of a, a oversimplification, but I, I, just, I just feel like God is, is wanting for all of us to to, to take that to another level of faith and confidence. I, I'm not just heard about you. I have seen you. I have seen what you can do. I have seen for myself. I have experienced it for myself. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, that means that that means it's not it's not forever. <laughs> a season, a season. I, I I feel pretty confident in a couple of months uh, or so we're we're gonna look back and this is all going to be over because it's a season. This is not this is not permanent. We. We don't know all the, the outcome. We don't know all the impact that's going to be had. But the bottom line is a season. I, I wonder how many of us are greatly rejoicing with what we're going through right now. I, I wonder how many of you, whatever you were already going through before all of this took place, were you rejoicing in it? Peter says, we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now, let me, let me just, the King James is temptation there, but that's, that's not temptation in the context of God tempting us to sin, or, or it's not temptation in the context that we're, we're being tempted to sin. 
It's, it's a testing. In fact, the next verse tells us what it is that's being tested or tempted. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Listen to the way the, uh, the excuse me, Young's literal translation says verse number 7. That the proof of your faith, the proof of your faith. No, notice, it's not saying your faith. It is saying the proof, or if I could say it this way, the testing of your faith is much more precious than of gold that is perishing. And through fire being approved may be found to praise and honor and glory in the revelation of of Jesus Christ. So, so you get what it's saying there. It, it is not saying, and, and I think our faith is more precious than gold, but it's not saying that our faith is more precious. It is saying that the testing, the process of our faith being tested is more precious. Why? Because an untested faith only has so much value. You know, there, there's all kinds of, uh, there's been all kinds of ideas of, of what somebody could create, of what somebody could do, of some kind of an invention that, that would uh, help in certain areas. And, and finally, somebody put it to the test, and it failed. And, and so, it is a blessing, <laughs> may not be a pleasurable blessing, may not be an enjoyable blessing. But it is a blessing from God when we go through things that test our faith. And, and I don't, I, I was sharing this verse with someone just a couple of weeks ago, and, and I don't think, and I'm going to see if I can get this out the way it's, it's kind of in my head. I don't think this, the context here is that God is testing our faith because he's trying to prove something to us. I don't think that it's like a God trying to show us in a negative sense. I do think it's actually God trying to show us in a positive sense. I think God is wanting us to know you have a faith that works. You have a faith that can withstand trials and tests and obstacles and, and problems and, and whatever else you faith. You have that. But I, need, but, but I want you to know that. And the only way you're going to know that is it's got to get tested. It's got to get proven. And so Peter says we rejoice. We rejoice. It, it reminds me of what Paul says. He says, I had a thorn and I besought the Lord three times. Take it away. And, and, and the Lord wouldn't take it away. And the Lord responds and says, My grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And, 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 and what happens then, Paul goes from begging God to take something away to now he says, I'm going to rejoice. The very thing I was asking God to take away, I'm now going to rejoice in that thing. Because in my weakness, he is made strong. I, I kind of think, and kind of goes back to something I said this morning when the psalmist said that God is a very present help in trouble. I think some of the places that our flesh, and I don't mean physically, I mean figuratively, some of the places or, or the conditions that our flesh likes to live in is the places where God isn't. We, we want to be in the, you know, our body's healthy, our, our relationship's good, our family's good, our finances good, good cars, good houses, good vacations, etc., etc. That, that's where we want to live. That's where Job thought God was. <laughs> if I could go back to those days. But God is a very present help in trouble, in the time of trouble. It was, it was, it was the three Hebrew children that, that they're standing there 
outside of the furnace and they're telling the king, we will not bow. Did you notice that when they, when they were standing outside of the furnace telling the king that they weren't going to bow, the king didn't say at that point, wait a minute, I thought there was three, I see four. It wasn't until they were in the fire. It wasn't until they were in the middle of the trial that, that the presence of God, if you will, was manifested in the way that the king says, we threw in three, but now there's a fourth one. He is a very present help in trouble, and it is the trying, the testing, the proving of our faith that is more precious than gold. A couple of more verses here, and I will wind down for this evening. Romans 5, starting with verse number 1. Paul says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now watch these next couple of verses. To me, these next couple of verses establish what is, I think, and I say this from, from I guess, personal experience, <laughs> that these next couple of verses are an ongoing cycle in our walk with God. These are not something to be completed, we get our diploma and we're done. This is something we live as a cycle in our relationship with God, in our ministry. So here's what he says. We have access by faith into this glory wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience, and experience produces hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. So notice, notice that progression. Tribulation. The word tribulation there, one of the very basic meanings of that word is pressure. So, so it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be the coronavirus. It doesn't have to be some natural disaster. It can be whatever you as an individual are dealing with in your life. Whatever, whatever personal challenges you're facing, whatever the circumstances you are going through, that can be tribulation. And so tribulation... Trials test difficulties. And, and notice what tribulation produces. <laughs> I don't know about you, but there is part of me I have to say is like, can we hurry up and get this over with? Can we be done with this? Can we, can we get back to doing the things that we're used to doing? I, 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 I am thankful that we can do this the way we do this, but I got to tell you, there, there's also something that's very uh, rewarding and fulfilling about us all being able to gather together for, for a church service and worship together. And, and I think all of these different things have a purpose and a place. And, and it's like, you know, let, let's do this as a, as a uh, luxury, not as a necessity. Can, can we get through this? But look at what Paul says, tribulation produces patience. And, and again, I think it's very important to understand this word patience. This is not patience in the sense that um, you, you, uh, you, you show up to the doctor's office, no offense, and I am extremely grateful and thankful for all of the health care people and everything they're doing. And, and so just pardon me for a moment to use this little example, but there's a couple of doctors that I've been to, a couple of them I go to regularly that almost without fail, I show up for what is my appointment time and I get seen about an hour later every single time. And, and, and so, you know, I think we think of patience in the sense of we sit there, smile on our face, waving at the receptionist, I'm good, no problem. Every, that, that's not what this word patience is. The, the, the meaning of this word patience is endurance. It, it has to do with this, this word patience also means to stay under. It means that I am not going to 
to opt out of what I'm in before God has done what he's doing. So, you know, I, I, I know that this would be really drastic, but God can do anything. I mean, it's possible for God to just in one moment eradicate the coronavirus and, and somehow all of the healthcare professionals and the government all is a testament, uh, it can testify to that, and suddenly we all go back to normal. But the bottom line is, we don't want to get out of what we're in one moment before God is finished with what He's doing. And so the tests, the trials, the problems produce endurance. And then the endurance or the patience produces experience. I, I know I've said this numerous times when I've used these verses in the past, but it, it, it's kind of uh, uh, ironic to me that um, you go to college, you spend four years or so, get a bachelor's degree, or maybe you go on to get a master's degree, and, and, and you see uh, um, job opportunities posted in the paper, online, whatever, and, and, and many of them will say, 10 years experience. Five years experience. How do you get experience without working? <laughs> but what they're saying is we, we want somebody who's, who's got not just head knowledge, but they, they've been through some things. They know how to do some things. And so our, our tribulation produces patience, which gives us experience, which helps us go from what I know about God to what I believe about God. And ultimately, that experience gives us hope. Hope says, God's brought me through things before. God's made a way before. I've been through difficulties before. I've been through challenges before. I've been through sickness before. I've, I've been through financial challenges before. And God has brought me through. So I have experience. And my experience gives me hope. I... I I do not at all propose to think that I know or would make any um, uh, forecasts of what, what things hold for the future. But I will say, as I've already said, as of right now, <laughs> this country, forget about the rest of the world and, and, and uh, what everybody else has been through. This country alone has been through much more severe challenges than we're in right now. And, and, and came through it. And I believe, I realize that probably humans would take the credit for it, but ultimately I believe God and His sovereignty brought us through it. And so we can look at that and from that we, we, we can gain hope that if God brought us through that, God can bring us through this. But I, 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 I'm challenging you again. For, forget the, 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 the big picture right now. For you as an individual, that God's desire is for you not to simply have a knowledge, a head knowledge of Him. But He wants you to believe. He wants you to have faith. He wants you to have confidence. The, the person that just knows about God responds the way Job did when adversity comes. Where are you, God? Why, why have you forsaken me? But the person that has belief and faith can also say what Job started to say. I, I may not really feel like I can find him, but I know, he knows where I am. And I know that when he gets done, I'm, I'm not going to be destroyed by this. But I'm going to come through this and, 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 and I'm going to be more than a conqueror, as Paul says. So again, I'm sure there are big picture things that God is doing. But just think about, if, if, if nothing else, if we all come through this, and when we get through it, we can take on a personal level, a, 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 if, we, if we have on a personal level, a strengthened, solidified faith and confidence and trust in God. What, what does the devil do when it's someone that he cannot shake your faith and confidence. When he can't mess with your mind, what, what, what chance does he have? And that's, that's really the, is that not really one of the biggest weapons that he has is, is messing with our minds? 
if he can get us, if he can get our minds going. It's it's like you know if 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 there was suddenly a loud noise in this house, we we probably would kind of look in the direction of it, but we we'd keep going. But let it be the middle of the night, and let a noise happen. I I know for me there've been several times that's happened, and it's a much different reaction. It's usually the heart rate goes crazy, and I am certain that the worst criminal in Anne Arundel County has just walked into my house. It, it's actually this has kind of happened the last couple of days. Um, with with Leo, shout out to Brother Vernell Spriggs for a Leo reference. Um, but, you know, during the daytime, he'll see somebody walk by on the street outside and he'll bark and we all ignore him because they'll go by and he'll stop. But a couple of times in the last week, two or three o'clock in the morning, he started barking. And my wife has made sure that I heard the barking. And the funny thing was, a couple of nights ago when it happened and he stopped barking, she was not reassured by him stopping his barking. She was actually pretty certain that the burglar had succumbed him and silenced him and he was now in danger and the rest of us were in danger. That didn't happen during the daytime. <laughs> it's our minds, our minds. But if we can have a sound mind, and if we can have not just knowledge, but belief, that, that's, that's pretty unshakable. Mm -hmm. And are we not in the midst of a world right now that doesn't need to know about God? They need to know what it is to believe and have confidence mm -hmm. that God hears, God answers, God knows mm -hmm. where I am. Mm -hmm. Praise God. We just, uh, before we sign off for this evening, let's just take a moment wherever you are and we just ask the Lord, in fact, can I encourage you to do this? Would you ask Him right now, God, whatever, whatever you're trying to do in me personally through all of this, whatever you're wanting me to learn in my walk with you through all of this, I, I want that to happen, Lord. Father, I thank you again for your wonderful, sweet presence that we have experienced again this evening, that in the midst of sort of chaos and, and, and being so much out of our routine and the norm, you have, you have manifested yourself in such a wonderful way, and I thank you so much for that. And God, I believe that you are, you are desiring to work in each one of our hearts and our lives. And, and, and we're at different levels. We're at different levels of our walk with you, different levels of our relationship with you. But the bottom line, God, is I, I believe that for every one of us, you, you want our faith and our, our confidence in you to be solidified and, and, and the foundation of our faith to be shored up so that when the winds blow and the storms come, once it all passes, we will be like that house that was built on a rock and continues to stand. I pray, God, for any person right now that's watching or will watch in the future that, that maybe they're at that point where right now it's, it's just knowledge. But that's the starting point. So I'm asking you to help them to move beyond the point of just knowledge of you, knowledge of who you are, to, to faith to belief, to confidence, that all of us, Lord, would ultimately be able to say what Job said. We've heard of you with our ears, but now because of what you've brought each one of us through, now because of what you've done in each one of our lives, we can say that we have seen you with our own eyes. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for taking the time to join with us this evening. And uh, we, again, will continue to communicate with you as, as we continue to navigate this season that we are in. God bless you.